Hi, my name's Robert Michaels, and I want to welcome you to Plain Talk on PTSD and suicide. We'll be looking at what PTSD is, what symptoms of suicide would be, but we're going to begin with understanding that just like physical wounds, invisible wounds can also kill you. Emotional scars caused by the things that you see and experience on the job. When 911 needs 911. I'm the CEO and founder of Serve and Protect. I was an MP with the 229th Military Police Battalion, a detective with Norfolk Police. I'm a chaplain, state, local, and federal, and guest lecturer for law enforcement and emergency services with this very seminar. I'm a member of the American Academy of Experts in Traumatic Stress and the National Center for Crisis Management. Let's get into the facts. Every 17 hours, a law enforcement officer commits suicide. That's from Forensic Examiner Magazine, Dr. Jean Larned, who was with the Behavioral Analysis Unit of the FBI. Recently, a report was released by the DOJ about Chicago police. And one of the facts that was buried in that report was that Chicago police officers die from suicide twice as often as they die in a line of duty death. 75% of officers have been divorced, 87% of firefighters. 40% of first responders are involved in domestic violence. 85% of first responders and 35% of dispatchers experience some symptoms of post-traumatic stress. In my opinion, it's 100% of all first responders. It begins with that first traumatic incident you experience. For me, my very first was a quintuple automobile fatality where five men in a car struck a pole and all five of their necks were snapped and they died instantly. The last, I was in the detective bureau and pulled up on an accident. A drunk driver broadsided an 18-year-old girl in a Volkswagen and drove her into a telephone pole. I heard her breathe her last breath. Let's look at some of the experiences that can cause trauma. Because they are traumatic incidents, and they can create post-traumatic stress symptoms, if not addressed properly. What causes PTSD? Now... There are some things that you might not consider apart from the accidents and the homicides and the other things you might witness. Here we have a sheriff's deputy kidnapped and raped on her way to work. This one is absurd. The Chicago Police Review Board head has decided that she thinks it's too much of a burden, too high a hurdle for a complainant to have to sign a form attesting to the veracity, the truthfulness of their complaint against a police officer. That has not been enacted yet, but that's what she wants to do. Here in this particular county, 41 sheriff's deputies resigned all at the same time. Why? Because their insurance plan would change on a Monday, so the Friday previous, they walked in, laid their badges on the desk, and filled out their retire papers and left. San Jose officers are so short-handed, they're living in RVs outside the department. They're working 17-hour shifts. The Ferguson effect. Chicago officer was beaten terribly because she was afraid to pull her weapon, afraid that somebody with a cell phone would make her look bad and disgrace the department. South Carolina chief was charged with murder in a shooting. I'm very familiar with this one because I spoke with that chief and helped him out. In that particular instance, the chief was involved in a 
officer-involved shooting. The man died. He was cleared by local, state, and federal authorities, including the FBI and DOJ. Three years later, after the decision in Ferguson to not indict Darren Wilson, a malicious prosecution began, and a local prosecutor charged this chief with murder. As it ends up, at the end of the day, they settled for a misdemeanor conviction, which means, as we all know, they had nothing to begin with. The Ferguson riots. You know, whether you were there or not, those who are first responders felt the vicarious trauma of seeing what they saw on the screen and feeling the pain for their brothers and sisters. Speaking of malicious prosecution, this particular prosecutor charged six police officers with homicide. They were cleared completely by a judge that routinely prosecutes and convicts police officers. So there was no there there. This is a good one. Big Bird de Blasio told police officers in tense situations they should close their eyes and count to ten. Brilliant. When we see that other officers have been shot or wounded, we feel that because we are a family across the country. When that Dallas ambush happened, we all had heavy hearts. We all grieved for the brothers and sisters in Dallas. And then, a short time later, in Baton Rouge. The Ferguson effect, once again, this is the Chicago officer. In Houston, there's another pension plan issue, and it may lead to 126 officers resigning. This one is an Indiana town without a police department. Why? Because they would only want buy one bulletproof vest for nine officers. That's so absurd, it's hard to put into words. Gangs make death threats against Danville officers. You know, when we hear threats made against police officers, and it happens regularly, those things create a traumatic effect for everybody, because whether it happens in Danville or Fredericksburg, those threats are real, and too often our brothers and sisters die at ambush. Baltimore police officer was shot in the wrist. People, for some reason, have taken to shooting police officers more. The ambush shootings of police officers are the highest in decades. In fact, Last year, in 2016, we lost 64 officers to gunfire. In addition, we lost 12 to vehicular homicide and three that were physically beaten to death, one of which went down an elevator shaft. A third of those deaths were by ambush. That sends a traumatic signal and feeling throughout the, the profession. Anti-police activists, political activists, and malicious prosecutors can indeed stimulate PTS symptoms, trauma. Who can forget pigs in a blanket, fry them like bacon? Or that particular prosecution in Baltimore? Or more recently, this piece of art, I use that term loosely, was hung on the walls of Congress by a congressman. And it was taken down by another congressman who found it offensive. The first congressman hung it back up. And ultimately, the architect of the Capitol, who is in charge of what goes on the walls, took it down. They are now filing a lawsuit against that architect to have it put back up. That's absurd. Look at this little cartoon. Those traumatic calls never get to you, do they? You're a rock. And all the while, he's a ticking time bomb. I'd love to have you download our mobile app. It's free. It gives all kinds of information, videos, articles. And from the very home screen, you can call our crisis line with one touch.
We're going to talk about the cast iron shield now. The cast iron shield is a God-given defense mechanism. It's emotional desensitization. Because if you felt emotionally every victim of a crime, every victim of an accident that you saw, you emotionally could not hold it together and do your job. So it's kind of like a callus. It builds up. It keeps our emotions check on the street. But unlike the uniform, you can't disengage the shield at home so it can easily impair family relationships. Each experience toughens that shield. Family and friends notice a change during the first year on the job. If you don't master it, it will master you. It will make you distance yourself from your family and friends. It's emotional desensitization. It's like a callus. If you don't work in the yard and all of a sudden you go out and start digging a hole, at the end of the day you're going to have a callus on your hand. Well, what this is is kind of like a callus. Each incident, each traumatic experience builds up that desensitization so that you're not feeling or you're categorizing differently those emotions. Some of the common reactions to trauma Distortion of time, sensory distortions and tunnel vision, perceptual or behavioral distortions, sense of helplessness, limited choices, feelings and impact of your fight, flight, freeze response to the incident, and perhaps a disturbance in memory. You may not remember things as they were. Hyperarousal, hypoarousal. Broca's area, that's a section in the brain. It helps put your thoughts and feelings into words. But during trauma, that shuts down. So it impedes your thoughts and speech. Words fail to capture the experience. According to the DSM-5, the Psychological Dictionary, the highest rates of PTSD are found among survivors of rape, military combat, first responders, and those who have been held in captivity. Pre-trauma risk factors. What can make you more susceptible? Family instability, family history of psychological disorders, multiple early losses, trouble with authority and genetics. The early losses could be the loss of a family member, a spouse, a parent, a sibling, any of those things can be losses. Absence of social support, earlier depression or anxiety, early substance abuse, ineffective coping skills. What is post-traumatic stress? It's a mental health condition that is triggered by a terrifying event, either experiencing it or witnessing it. Now, the part about witnessing it, this is why we feel what we feel when we saw what happened in Dallas or Baton Rouge or where we see officers who have been killed. We feel that and it is a traumatic piece of news. We weren't there, but we witnessed it on the screen. It's an emotional wound, but here's the important thing. It's a normal reaction to an abnormal circumstance or experience. Many people develop mental disorders other than post-traumatic stress. Acute stress disorder is the term used when symptoms develop within the first month. The term PTSD with delayed onset is when it takes longer for the impact to be recognized. The DSM-5 expanded the criteria for PTSD. Re-experiencing and intrusive thoughts meaning the, the scenes from the traumatic event pop into your head. Avoidance, negative alteration in cognition and mood, marked alteration in cognition and mood. When someone either is engaged in or witnesses a traumatic event, the incident first processes the short-term memory, and in time, onto long-term memory without further issue. For some, however, 
the traumatic incident gets stuck in short term, if you will. Over time, weeks, it might trigger acute stress symptoms like anger, sleeplessness, etc. It might present in one of three ways. Hypervigilance, being tense and on guard, anger, rage, sleep problems, anxiety, depression, relationship issues, familial and on the job, social withdrawal, potentially suicidal ideations, and angry with God. Addiction is not a symptom. It's a byproduct. It's self-medication. So acute stress disorder is most often diagnosed when exposed to a traumatic event in which both of the following were present. The person experienced, witnessed, or was confronted with an event or events that involved actual or threatened death or serious injury. Secondly, though not required, the person's response is likely to involve intense fear, helplessness, or horror, either while experiencing or after experiencing the, de the distressing event. The individual has three or more of the following disassociative symptoms. A sense of numbing, detachment or absence, a reduction in awareness of his or her surroundings, derealization, depersonalization, and disassociative amnesia. Post-traumatic stress. We've talked about that just a moment ago. Fear triggers many split-second changes in the body to help defend against danger, to avoid it. This is the fight-or-flight response. Nearly everyone will experience a range of reactions to trauma, yet most people recover from initial symptoms naturally. People who have PTSD may feel stressed or frightened even when they're not in danger. And delayed expression, about a quarter of PTSD uh, cases is with delayed onset. That could be six months later. With acute stress disorder, that's generally within the first month. Not all who experience the same traumatic event develop PTSD, but constant exposure can develop some symptoms. What we experience is cumulative. You don't just have one event. You have multiple events that you witness, and it adds up. Emotional trauma is a normal response. I can't emphasize this enough to abnormal circumstances. Things that you see and experience on the job. And don't forget, we talked about administrative issues, which can easily cause stress, cause stress and anxiety, and ultimately, like bullying, lead to post-traumatic stress. Fatalities, especially involving children or Suicides, homicides, dismemberment or burn victims, all of these are things that can cause PTSD. 9-11, Oklahoma bombing, all of those things were terrible. Uh, just like the club down in Orlando, the Pulse Club, I cannot imagine what it was like walking in that club, whether you're a paramedic or a first responder, a law enforcement officer, crime scene technician, and you're hearing phones go off, the smells and the sounds would have been horrible. Just like at Newtown, it would have been terrible. Now, one thing that's important, failure to communicate what you're feeling, bottling it up, is going to enhance the likelihood that you experience some emotional distress. All first responders, Dispatchers and corrections officers experience traumatic events. It's part of the job. Trauma can be caused by job stress, finances, administrative issues. Now, it is my contention that all first responders are affected by trauma in some form, just like we talked about the cast iron shield. Now, you might think that, that you have escaped that and you're not really affected. Ask your spouse. For public safety, critical incidents are cumulative, not a single accident. Throughout a career, you can witness a ton. When you experience trauma, your left brain functions defer to your right brain, which is observing and reacting to the immediate threat. Fight or flight, 
That's what happens. The left brain, which processes details, specifics, is not reacting to the traumatic event. It's deferring to the right brain. There's a, there's a look at the right versus the left hemisphere, some of the things that they control. The right hemisphere in trauma is intuitive. It's emotional. It's visual. It's spatial and tactical. It's first to develop in the womb. During trauma and flashbacks, the right side activates and the left side declines. You're in survival mode. The left side is executive functioning, linguistic, sequential, analytic. It helps us remember facts, statistics, vocabulary of the event. It's developed later in life. In a traumatic experience, the reaction may be automatic. In fact, it will be. And not recall clearly because it was the key to survival. Memory distortion, time and tunnel vision, perceptions. The best thing to do if you've been involved in a traumatic incident, don't give a statement. Don't tell everybody what happened until you've had two complete sleep, sleep cycles because your brain is still operating on the right side. And remember, it's the left side that has the details. In a traumatic situation, it's not uncommon to lose control of your bowels or urine. And I know you're laughing, but that's true. Now, here's a practical illustration. A police officer in Chicago was involved in a shooting. He saw a suspect on an L car, and he had guns. He had a gun pointed at civilians. There were police on board. When the officer arrived, he had a clear shot at the suspect and he took it. When he was debriefed, they asked him how many shots did he fire. He said one. When they unloaded his weapon, he had fired seven shots. Again, it's because his right brain reacted instinctively. And what are we taught? To neutralize the threat and don't stop shooting until that is accomplished. The left side of the brain that would have counted the number of shots was not doing anything other than deferring to the right brain. This is why it's important, again, to wait two sleep cycles before making a statement. The time of the incident, you're not using critical thinking skills, rather survival mode. Remember, if you're not treated after a critical incident, the brain can stay in survival mode. Emotional impulses may continue to trigger, and this can easily become post-traumatic stress. It's normal and with proper treatment, post-traumatic stress can be often relieved, changed, and healed. The emphasis is that PTSD is a condition. It's an invisible wound, an emotional scar that can be changed with proper treatment. We always refer to a trauma specialist who has an understanding of and experience with public safety. I'll tell you a little bit about what we do at Serve and Protect. We're a nonprofit and we're nationwide. And when we get calls, we facilitate trauma therapy for first responders. We make sure that the therapist is experienced in trauma, understands their job, and takes their insurance. And we filter it by making sure that they use modalities of treatment that we feel are appropriate or best practices. Two of those are rapid resolution therapy and EMDR, eye movement desensitization reprocessing. There are a couple of others. Somatic experience is a good one. Brain spotting. Perhaps a service dog. If you've been through treatment and it's just not cutting it for you, it may be that a service dog or equine therapy might help. Talk to your therapist. Maybe recreational therapy, like an organization called Hunting for Heroes. The first step to healing is admitting the problem. If you keep denying it, you're not going to be helped. The second step is asking. Whether it's us or someone you know, ask for help. And lastly, 
You've got to engage in the process. You can't just show up and be present. You've got to actually engage. Addiction may be a co-occurring issue with post-traumatic stress, and it must be treated simultaneously. It's a co-occurring, co-occurring disorder. If they treat the addiction and do not treat the post-traumatic stress, chances are you'll go right back to the addiction because it's a self-medicating process so that you don't think about the things that are bothering you. Now, addiction with PTSD, like I said, is self-medication, and it's not always substances. It could include, include pornography, gambling, extreme exercising, affairs, things like that that you just absolutely are committed to to numb your mind. Again, the emphasis is that it's a condition, an invisible wound, an emotional scar that can be changed, but it starts with a call. Our crisis line number is 615-373-8000. Real solutions for real problems. We work with you to find what's best for you. Asking for help is strength, not weakness. Look at this illustration. You see the iceberg floating above the water, but look at all that's beneath. If you remember the Titanic, it wasn't what they saw that took the ship down. It was that the iceberg under the water extended out pretty far, and it sliced a, a hole right in the side of the ship, and the unsinkable Titanic went down. You may feel impervious to trauma. But my friends, with what you see and what you experience, you simply are not. So, how do you change PTSD from a disorder to having help, having victory, physical, emotional, and spiritual hygiene? Take care of your body. Proper nutrition and exercise, rest. Just say no to addictive elements like booze and narcotics or addictive habits. Rest and relax. Your mind. Get by with a little help from your friends, peers, those who are around you, your support group. Get appropriate therapy through EMD or rapid resolution or one of the other modalities. For me, it's being transformed by the renewing of your mind, as it says in Romans 12, 2. And, you know, we all have a soul. What we do with that and how we treat that soul is going to affect how we are emotionally. For me, it's all about trust, security, strength for tough times, and peace. These verses address those things specifically. Now, this is the Americans with Disability Act specifically addressing depression and post-traumatic stress and other mental health conditions in the workplace. You in public safety are covered by this. Now, if you'll notice, what if my mental health condition could affect my job performance? They are required to give you consideration and to make accommodations for your disorder. And how can you get reasonable accommodation? That's an important question. You need to talk to your supervisor and HR and explain what's going on. If they refuse to address this, you might need to get a lawyer. What if I'm being harassed because of my condition? I can tell you that happens. I can tell you that there are people that have lost their jobs because, well, they weren't told it was because of post-traumatic stress, but that's actually what happened. I can tell you a case in point, a deputy in Tennessee, he was involved in a shooting. He responded to a call, a wife called the dispatcher and said, my husband's going to kill me. They could hear an argument. They dispatched two deputies. His backup was 30 minutes away. So he pulled into the driveway, could hear the argument, could hear her screaming for her life, don't kill me. He went in through the garage and the kitchen door and there was the husband with a weapon and shot the deputy twice, once in the upper right, once in the abdomen. And he returned fire, the deputy, 
and kill the husband. He was given a medal by the governor, and he was on administrative leave with pay because of his injuries and because of post-traumatic stress. But there came a point in time when they would not accommodate him. They wouldn't give him a desk job. He kept pushing for that. Ultimately, he got a letter in the mail. It said, Dear Deputy, wanted to let you know that you have been terminated because you cannot return to work because of injuries sustained in the line of duty. And they fired him. He sent me a copy of the letter, and there it was, signed by the sheriff. The media got a hold of that letter, went out and interviewed the sheriff, who quickly said, oh, no, 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 that's not what we intended. Uh, you know, of course he's going to come back. We provide trauma services for PTSD, addictions, anxiety, depression, suicide, relationships. Our partner, Safe Call Now, helps with the addictions and some of the residential care, in fact, all of the residential care. You call that number, 615-373-8000, and the person on the other end answering will be either an active or retired first responder. Real solutions for your real problems. Again, I want to suggest that you go to our website. It's a free download. Click on download, and it's available in both um, Android and iPhone. It's free, and you can call for help right from the home screen. Let's talk about suicide. Suicide is a clear and present danger. Here in Tennessee, we have lost a goodly number to suicide. One just recently. Every 17 hours, a law enforcement officer commits suicide. Firefighter suicide is skyrocketing. P PD and FD suicides show up sometimes as a murder suicide. Suicide by perp. In other words, an officer shows up, gets involved in a gunfight, but intentionally doesn't respond appropriately so that they can be killed. Intentional auto accident or running into a burning building with no intention of coming out. And suicide is no respecter of rank, and it is not a respecter whether you're local, state, or federal. Let's look at some examples. New Orleans, officer commits suicide after a federal investigation. Here, a cop killed his wife and son, torched home, and then shot himself. NYPD detective shoots himself. A Secret Service agent on the Obama detail committed suicide. An officer who killed himself was a 22-year police veteran. Eight deaths so far in 2016, and that was early, and that was Canada's first responder PTSD crisis. They're having PTSD, and as a result, they weren't getting the help, and they committed suicide. An Arlington officer under state investigation. And you know, if you get into trouble, sometimes guys think that that's the only answer, but it is not. Your family needs you. Former San Francisco assistant police chief. There's a police chief. This one is particularly troublesome. Um, this was the officer who called in that he was chasing suspects. When people responded to his location, they found him dead. He had been shot. There was no description of the suspects. They spent hundreds of thousands of dollars in helicopters, canine, all kinds of search for those people that shot that officer. Sadly, the department failed to reveal that he was under investigation. And the more they dug, it turned out to be a suicide. And in fact, he was doing some wrong things. Here a police chief shoots himself just after he was suspended. Fire chief dies by suicide. Chattanooga police lieutenant. More officers die from suicide than shootings and crashes. The Michigan deputy and his wife were murder-suicide. New York police officer was found dead in her patrol car. 
prison guard after a riot killed himself. Another corrections officer killed himself. And corrections officers are suspect to suicide because the average life expectancy of a corrections officer is 58 years. You guys that are in corrections experience a tremendous amount of trauma. A female firefighter's suicide caused an investigation of cyberbullying. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I had to go there. He was brave enough to show his shirt, but he got hassled so, without a shirt, he got hassled so much that he committed suicide, and that's very unfortunate. A slain guard, the co-worker, committed suicide. Firefighter commits suicides days after the arrest. Suicide epidemic hits corrections officers. Let's look at the lies. These are the lies that you will be told or that will run through your mind about suicide. My family will be better off without me. I can tell you this. I've worked with families of suicide victims, and I can tell you conclusively, not one of them shouted for joy and were better off. There was tremendous trauma, both for the, the spouse as well as the children. They went through terrible things. The insurance will give financial relief. Well, maybe not. No one cares. No way out of my circumstances, like the people that got into trouble. There's no hope. There's always hope. I can tell you that. All you got to do is call us, and we'll tell you where there is hope. No one can help me, or I'd be better off dead. Look at some warning signs. Talking about suicide. Seeking out lethal means. Somebody says to you, what do you think would be the best gun to kill yourself with, or the best means? Preoccupation with death. No hope for the future. Self-loathing. Ah, man, I can't believe it. I'm just so stupid. I'm, I'm worthless. I can't believe I've done this to my family and to my, to my peers. I've embarrassed everybody. When you start hearing that, perk up. Getting affairs in order. If you notice that one of your peers is all of a sudden making sure they've got insurance and a will, and unless there's some significant reason why, pay attention. And this one in particular, saying goodbye. If you hear from somebody you haven't talked to in a while and they call up and they say, hey, listen, uh, man, I just wanted to call you and uh, I haven't talked to you in a while. Just wanted to catch up. That can be a symptom of suicide. Not always, but it can be. Withdrawing from others, isolation, self-destructive behavior, taking all of the risks, trying extreme sports that they've never done before, sudden sense of calm. All of a sudden they've been hyper and they all of a sudden they turn up and everything's fine. They're calm. It's okay. That could be a symptom. Now, with Serve and Protect, we are your backup. You call our crisis line, 615-373-8000. We care. We are there for you. We want to offer you hope. We'll get people that can treat whatever trauma you've experienced and whether, whatever depression you're encountering. Peer-to-peer. -peer. Sometimes talking to a peer will help for some issues. However, when confronted with serious and career-ending kinds of things, chances are not going to talk to a peer. That's why we exist. We're a safety net. We have peer advocates with Serve and Protect. Like I said, each one of them is an active or retired first responder. We can get them on board with you to talk with you and help you think through what you're going through. And at the same time, we have a care coordinator that will help you locate the trauma therapist in your neighborhood, your area, that takes your insurance and understands your job. Chaplains are a good listening ear, too. They are to listen with their ear and with their heart. They're to care. They are to be a servant. Most of all, a chaplain has a ministry of presence, being there being around you, 
so that you know their name. Employee assistance programs. In some cases, this works, but there have been too many cases that we've been contacted about where employee assistance violated the very principles under which it operates because rather than getting the help that they need, the officers got fired. So, what do we do? Education, like this seminar, we do seminars for departments, both in law enforcement and emergency services. We'll be glad to do seminars with criminal justice classes. Facilitation. From your first contact with Safe Call Now, they will determine which avenue you need to go, whether it's residential or to a trauma therapist. Trauma therapy, then we locate somebody in, their, in, in the caller's area that takes their insurance, understands a job, and really understands trauma in, in the culture of law enforcement and emergency services. Restoration. Our goal at the end of the day is that you recover, that you're restored to your work. We do everything we can to make that happen with right treatment processes and proper follow-up. Our unique 360 focus. Um, if somebody goes into residential care, we make available to that person a chaplain to stay in touch with their family back at home to help them through the time that they're going through. And we make sure that if that facility will work with us, which most of them will, we will locate a trauma therapist so that when the release is coming, when they're going home, we already have a trauma therapist located that takes the insurance and understands the job so that we can make sure that the continuum of care is there. When 911 needs 911, we're your backup. Our crisis line is confidential. It's, na it's nationwide. That's the number, 24-7-365. Here's our team. Me, Rob Michaels. Rose Casali. Rose is our care coordinator and spouse advocate. If your spouse is struggling with your job, Rose would be more than happy to talk with them. Carrie Steiner. Carrie has a doctorate in clinical psychology. She operates the First Responders Wellness Center outside of Chicago, and she's our clinical advisor, and she's on our board. Rob Casali. Rob is a peer advocate, as is Dr. Rich Kelly and Michael DeJesus, Donnie Hecox, and Houston Gass. Each one has unique experiences. Houston, for example, was on a call, turned a doorknob, and was shot in the face with a 12-gauge shotgun. So there's not much you're going to confront him with that he has an experience. And then Judd Granzow. Judd played on the University of Tennessee National Championship team, and he put together a fitness program for first responders. Now, these are our mascots. Yep, they're part of our A-team. Our partners and alliances, Sean Riley with Safe Call Now, Carrie Steiner from First Responder Wellness Center, Dr. Holland Michaels, he's a, a therapist, and I will say she is my daughter, Dr. Olivia Johnson, the Blue Wall Institute, Dr. John Conley with Rapid Resolution, Robert Douglas with the National Police Suicide Foundation, Jeff Dill with the Firefighter Behavioral Health Alliance, Jennifer O'Neill who has hope and healing at Hill and Glade, doing equine therapy, Law Enforcement Legal Defense Fund, and the Badge of Honor Memorial Foundation. Again, consider keeping us on your phone. Download our mobile app. We'll be glad to help you. Body, mind, and soul. That's what we do. We treat the whole man. We facilitate services for the whole man. Now, 
Check out our website, serveprotect.org, on Facebook, slash serveprotect, by email, rob at serveprotect.org, if you have any questions, or Twitter, at serveprotect. Again, in our crisis line, 615-373-8000. And this has been Plain Talk about PTSD and suicide. I'm Rob Michaels, and on behalf of our team, thank you for watching our seminar. We hope that it's been helpful. If you have any suggestions, email me at rob at serveprotect.org. Thank you.